Whatever the case with Omicron, health experts still insist the key to putting the pandemic behind us is vaccination. So Europe is taking the bull by the horns. At least Greece is, with just 60 percent of his population fully vaccinated. The Greek prime minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, is now mandating it for everyone over the age of 60 or face a monthly recurring fee of 100 euros. That's about $113. He says he was personally tormented by this decision, but insists that it is not a punishment, just the price of health care. And Prime Minister Mitsotakis is joining me now from Athens for an exclusive interview. Welcome to the program, Prime Minister. I guess the first question is, how did it get this way in Greece? Who are the unvaccinated? Well, uh, first of all, Christian, let me point out uh, that uh, more than three out of four uh, adult Greeks have already uh, received the first dose of the vaccine. Uh, but uh, um, we were facing a situation where 17 percent of people above 60 had not yet been vaccinated. Uh, and unfortunately, these are the people who end up in our hospitals. They end up uh, occupying the overwhelming majority of our ICU beds. And unfortunately, these are the people who lose their lives. I think we've done everything in our capacity to convince these people that they need to get vaccinated. We've run a very extensive uh, uh, PR campaign. Uh, I mean, the case has been made very, very convincingly that you risk uh, um, uh, getting severely sick if you are unvaccinated. So we did take the decision to move towards mandatory vaccination, imposing a monthly fine. And what I can tell you is that since we took the decision, we have seen a significant uptake uh, in appointments for, from, from people from this age group to actually get vaccinated. So I would hope that by January 16th, uh, when the fine is going to kick in, uh, an overwhelming majority of those people will take the decision to get vaccinated. Not everyone will take that decision, uh, but it seems that uh, the mandatory aspect of our decision making has nudged enough people um, uh, to take the necessary step to protect themselves and their families. So let me just read a few statistics from, from your office. Nine out of 10 deaths in Greece from COVID are with citizens 60 and over. Seven out of 10 who have to be intubated are 60 and over. Eight out of 10 intubated are unvaccinated. So I guess I could ask you, why did it take you this long then to impose the idea of fines? I mean, you said it was a decision that personally tormented you, but could you have taken it earlier? Well, uh, uh, first of all, let me point out that the statistics are not different from what you see in any other country. I mean, right now we have a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, and if you if you talk to any of my colleagues, they will tell you that it is the unvaccinated who get severely sick. They are the ones who end up um, in the ICU beds and unfortunately they lose their lives. Uh, according to our constitution, we have to take uh, progressive uh, measures. And of course, mandatory vaccination uh, is the, the ultimate measure that uh, we can take. Uh, we had already mandated uh, mandatory vaccinations for healthcare professionals, and now we're extending it to the people above 60. But I, I do, I would point out that we're just a second European country uh, doing that. I wouldn't be surprised, Christian, if other European countries follow uh, in our path. Uh, the President of the Commission mentioned that mandatory vaccinations uh, need to be discussed. Of course, every country is different. Every country has different constitutional uh, constraints. But I'm a liberal politician. I don't like mandatory measures uh, by, by nature, but uh, I feel it is the right decision uh, to protect um, uh, people who I know, um, if they don't get vaccinated, uh, will, get, uh, will get sick. And, uh, and some of them, unfortunately, uh, will lose uh, their lives. So I'm um, uh, very comfortable with the decision uh, that we, we took. And so far, if we just look at how quickly vaccination rates have uh, increased, uh, I think we, we took the right decision. In general, we've tried to be ahead of the curve. Um, uh, we were the first, uh, one of the first European countries to open booster shots um, uh, to all age groups. Uh, uh, our uh, healthcare experts have reduced uh, the interval between the second and the third uh, shots to three months. And also in our case, the vaccination certificate will expire seven months after you had your second shot. So we're trying our best to also make sure that people who have already um, who are already vaccinated will get their booster shots and we're one of the European leaders when it comes to putting the third uh, shot into people's arms. Well, clearly the proof is in the pudding. And as you say, um, if people have increased their uptake, that's a good thing. Every health expert in the world says there is no 
way out of this pandemic without a much wider and broader vaccination campaign. But I just want to put up a graph because you said your statistics are similar to your neighbors across Europe. I mean, I don't know what you call neighbors, but um, Portugal has 81.6% of its population fully vaccinated. And then you see the others going down and you're at 62.4%. So I see why you needed or wanted to do that. But let me ask you, because inevitably politics gets played, the leader of your opposition, former Prime Minister Tsipras, has said, and I'm sure you've read it, instead of expanding vaccination rates in the population, as everyone hoped, we'll have a wave of reaction that will not help anyone. Your comment on that. You've already told me that in the interim, it has expanded and increased the uptake. Are you concerned at all that there might be reaction and protest like you see in the Netherlands, in Belgium and elsewhere? We've had very limited protests, Christian, and I think this is a, a very, very good sign. Uh, and uh, we've also imposed significant restrictions on the unvaccinated. Again, we were one of the first European countries to make it clear that if you want to go have a meal in a restaurant or if you want to go to a movie, you have to be vaccinated. A negative test will not do the trick. Now, unfortunately, we haven't had as much political consensus as in other countries. I mean, the opposition has chosen uh, to, to make the, the pandemic a political issue. I think they're making a, a, a big mistake because we're struggling with the same problem uh, as any other country uh, in, uh, in the world. But again, as you said, um, the proof um, um, is in the pudding and uh, we need to see vaccination rates uh, increase. We've seen that significantly um, over the past uh, weeks. Uh, so I think that our policies uh, eventually will be vindicated. Uh, uh, the other um, aspect of our policies, which I would like to highlight, which I think is very important, is, uh, of course, uh, expand testing even further. Uh, this week, we're launching a universal testing for the entire population. Every Greek citizen has a right to a self-test. We will do the same immediately after New Year's Eve to make sure that we also identify uh, citizens who are possibly, who would possibly test positive but have no symptoms. And again, that's the only way to keep our economies uh, open. We do not intend to impose a lockdown. The Greek economy uh, is going to grow significantly this year. Uh, the statistics for the third quarter came out just today, more than 11% increase uh, in our GDP. Our tourism did uh, very well. So if we want to keep our economies uh, open and functioning and make sure we create enough wealth for all Greeks, we have to get vaccinated and we have to make sure that we adhere to the basic precautions, uh, getting tested and making sure we wear our masks. How do you explain that you did, I mean, you were one of the early, I mean, way back when, when the pandemic started back in 2020, you were one of the first to impose, you know, strict measures. And by that summer, Greece was the destination of choice for many, many people who couldn't go anywhere else. And, and there was, you know, a big tourism boom in your country. How do you account for that success where other countries have seen less success in terms of keeping their economy open and their health sort of, you know, in control as well. Well, uh, look, we did particularly well during the first wave because we shut down the economy very quickly. I mean, we've done less well during the second and the third wave, as you know, was the case yeah. in most uh, European countries. But as far as tourism is concerned, I think we communicated very, very clearly what are the rules. We wanted people to visit Greece safely. They did so. Uh, in significant numbers during the summer. Uh, we did better than we uh, expected. And of course, now uh, we want to prepare for an even better tourism season uh, in 2022, uh, assuming we have no other uh, unpleasant surprises. But even you know, with the uh, Omicron uh, variant, again, we don't know um, uh, how, um, uh, uh, you know, how bad it, this is uh, going to get. But what we do know uh, is right now there is one, uh, uh, one remedy, and that is vaccines, uh, not just uh, the first and the second dose, but also the booster shot. So we're focusing on, on that. But again, as far as the pandemic is concerned, uh, I mean, clear communication uh, and, and rapid decision making uh, is critical. Uh, and again, if for, for whatever reason one needs to change their mind, this happens when data um, uh, sort of indicates that we should do that. We had not planned to make uh, vaccination mandatory, but uh, we, uh, we, we looked at the data, we looked at Omicron, and we said this is the right decision and we need to take it now uh, to, to protect our people and make sure we have no, no further unnecessary loss of life. 
Talking about loss of life, um, and it is tragic, there is a considerable loss of life amongst migrants and those seeking asylum in Europe um, not so long ago here between France and, and the UK and the English Channel. You know, the, the unbelievable sight of 27 people, including children, drowning in the English Channel, just trying to get asylum, which is their right. Um, and the Pope, of course, has been on the Greek island of Lesbos, and he has been very, very concerned. That, of course, you have a very big migrant um, camp there. And he's talking in general about, you know, unreasonable fears of migrants, of, of, of countries, about migrants. And he's talking about, I, I mean, his actual words were, we're witnessing a retreat from democracy in, in Europe by people and politicians lured by the populist wave. What's your reaction to that? Because if you look at Britain, if you look at France, even though right-wing politicians make a big deal about migrants, there actually aren't that many, relatively speaking, coming into those countries. Well, uh, we suffer from uh, being a country that is uh, on the external border of uh, the European Union. And uh, we're very happy that the Pope visited us for a second time. I'm sure that uh, when he went to Lesbos, he saw a situation that was significantly improved uh, compared to 2016. We now have organized facilities that offer um, humane treatment to desperate people who reach uh, our uh, shores. But I think uh, uh, it is right to point out that there hasn't been enough uh, solidarity when it comes to sharing the burden uh, of migration. Um, uh, Greece um, uh, has granted more than 50,000 um, um, uh, asylum uh, um, uh, uh, permits uh, uh, over, the past, uh, over the past year. We were the one European country, Christian, that welcomed women from Afghanistan in significant numbers. We have more 800 women and their families uh, in Greece because we thought this was the right thing um, uh, to do to offer uh, these women and their families uh, uh, protection. Um, uh, from a regime that could possibly uh, persecute them. At the same time, uh, we are defending uh, our borders with full respect um, uh, for fundamental rights, um, uh, and we feel that this is the right uh, approach to take. We have to uh, eradicate uh, the smuggler networks. We have to stop people being trafficked uh, uh, in these horrible conditions. And the one way of doing it is to open legal uh, pathways um, um, to people who would want to come to Greece, come to Europe, um, uh, to not just um, um, uh, be safe from war and persecution, but also to seek um, uh, a better economic um, uh, future. Unfortunately, we haven't made much progress. Um, in terms of European solidarity on this file. And yes, there are European countries uh, who consider this simply not to be their problem. And they just want to um, uh, make it the problem of the countries that uh, simply by, uh, by virtue of their geographic position happen to be on the external borders of the European Union. Let me play this soundbite from the Pope. I mean, he is the world's moral leader, and he's used the plight of refugees throughout his papacy. And this is what he said about, about civilization and the risk, you know, to civilization from the way migrants are treated. The Mediterranean, which for millennia has brought different peoples and distant lands together, is now becoming a grim cemetery without tombstones. This great basin of water, the cradle of so many civilizations, now looks like a mirror of death. Brothers and sisters, please let us stop this shipwreck of civilization. So, so that's pretty pointed, and I'm just wondering whether you think, you know, not just war, but climate also will push more migrants. Let me just quote the World Bank. 200 million people could become internal climate migrants or displaced by 2050. And I'm just wondering, you know, what, what you think when you envision that possibility, and this is now a climate question, whether you and everybody else can manage the climate crisis before this happens. Well, you're right to point out that unless we address the underlying causes of, uh, of, of migration, we will be under more uh, pressure. But uh, just to come back to the words uh, of the Pope, very, very powerful uh, words, I can tell you that you know, we're doing our best every day to save people that, uh, uh, whose, uh, whose lives are at risk at sea. But we also need to work with our neighbors. And in this case, we need to work with Turkey. Uh, I mean, Turkey in the past has uh, weaponized migration. You remember very well what happened in March 2020. 
Uh, I think they're taking a different approach now, which is the right approach. We need to cooperate together to eradicate the smugglers. Uh, in our case, it's a very short distance uh, between uh, the Turkish uh, shore and uh, the Greek islands. And we're happy that uh, uh, we have managed to significantly reduce arrivals uh, by more than 80% uh, since I uh, took over as prime minister. And this also sends a signal to smugglers, uh, but also to the customers. Don't try this. This is a very, very uh, dangerous uh, journey. So unless we eradicate these networks and at the same time uh, offer um, uh, uh, legal pathways, legal entry points uh, for migration, the situation uh, is not going to be addressed. But also uncontrolled migration, uh, what we saw in 2015, where essentially we, we opened our borders to anyone, that is clearly also not uh, the solution. And that also will not be tolerated mm. uh, by European public opinion. Prime Minister, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Important topics. Thanks a lot.